Growing up, one of my greatest pastimes, greatest joys, was playing in the backyard uh, in Troy, Missouri, at my, my parents' home, with my next door neighbor. My next door neighbor was two years older than me, and in the backyard of our three acre lot, there was a creek that ran behind. And as young boys who like to play in creeks, it doesn't take long for them to figure out that if you stop up the water with rocks, you can make it deeper on one side of the dam, and you can make the water basically stop flowing on the other side of the dam. This is a really fun thing to do for any boy that is playing in creeks. Uh, But the boys quickly realize, and it's like, oh, how big can we build it, and how much water can we get to pool up? But you quickly realize what effect that's going to have if you just leave it there. Well, there's not going to be a creek on the other side. There's not going to be life on the other side. And this is similar to the Sea of Galilee. Never been to the Holy Land. You're in good company. I haven't either. Uh, But the Sea of Galilee is amazingly green. One of the most beautiful places in the world. There's so much life. There's so much, uh, not just fish, but there are also all kinds of plants and greenery all over. And this comes from the, the Jordan River, flows into the Sea of Galilee. And then what flows out of the Sea of Galilee is still the Jordan River. But after 100 miles, you follow that river and you get to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is a very different scene. It lives up to its name. There's nothing that can live there. There's nothing at all that survives in the Dead Sea. But it's coming from the same source, the same water that's flowing through this rich, lush Sea of Galilee doesn't bear life in the Dead Sea. And that's because there's no outlet. There's no way for the water to continue to flow out of the Dead Sea. It stops there. And what happens in the Dead Sea is what would happen in a creek if the water was stopped up and it became stagnant. And it would become a stinking cesspool. It's not very pleasant. Very different than the most beautiful place in the world. And what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with mercy? You see, if we really are the body of Christ, if we really are all members of the same body, and it's true that we are all sinners, and not only our creation being a gift, something that we could never repay, but us being forgiven as Christians, being given new life, divine life, what can we possibly do but share that with one another? That's the only way that we're able to remain fruitful, to remain like the Sea of Galilee rather than the Dead Sea. And now what does this have to do with our king and these servants today in the gospel? You see, I have a math degree, and so whenever there's money or, or numbers involved, I get kind of excited. So if you'll excuse me uh, for a moment, but the actual translation is that there are 10,000 talents, 10,000 talents. That's how much was owed to the king from the first servant. And 10,000 talents, don't worry, I've done the math for you. And I didn't know this either. Father Simeon, a Trappist monk, he's the one who's in his commentary taught me this, that 10,000 talents equals 100 million denarii. You think, I don't know what a denarii is. Help me out. A denarii is one day's wage, a full day. And so if you calculate that out, that's 2,739 years, years of work. That's the debt that was owed to the king, 2,739 years of work. Not only his lifetime wouldn't be enough, but all of his children's lifetime and his grandchildren's lifetime, they wouldn't be enough to pay back that debt if they give every penny to the king. It's impossible. It's abs- it was an absurd number, and that's something we lose without having that translated for us. And so now let's compare that to the sum that the fellow servant owed the other servant. The wicked servant was so mad, so angry, and he began to choke his fellow servant over 100 denarii. That's three months' wages. Three months' wages. When he was just forgiven a debt that was infinite. We're talking thousands of years. And this is the kind of Dead Sea that we see when we don't forgive. When we don't extend the same mercy that our Father has extended to us, we become like this wicked servant. Gross. Hard to look at. Not life-giving, but rather taking life as he chokes his servant. Because forgiveness gives new life. The phrase that's used in the Greek is, be patient with me, be long-suffering with me. 
And when the servant asks the king, be long-suffering with me, this is something that only God is able to do. The king obviously represents God. And God actually gives him new life. He forgives him the whole debt so that he has a whole new life. He can start completely over, debt-free, with his family, with his property. He's given new life. This forgiveness, this mercy, it's actually life-giving. And this is what we're expected to share as well. This is what we're expected to do when we give someone forgiveness. We give them space to live a new life. We give them space to step out of the box that maybe we put them in, or maybe their habits put them in, and we say, I want you to live a totally new life, and I forgive you. And that's a beautiful, amazing thing, but it's not an easy thing. I don't want to pretend that it's easy because it's not. In fact, it's a divine thing, this forgiveness that we're talking about. If it was human alone, and that's why you don't see it outside of the Christian context, because it's not something that mere man can do without God's help. I think of uh, an example with my, one of my seminarian brothers from years ago, and I was so irked by his habits and, and the way that he uh, would interact with me and the way that he interacted with others that I began to avoid him at lunch table and at breakfast table. I'm like, I'll just go sit over here. I'll just go and start a new table. I don't want to sit next to that guy. And I could feel this bubbling and like not so much bubbling with life, but bubbling with death inside me. I don't like that feeling. And so after a long time of this taking place, I went to him. I went to his room, I knocked on the, his door, and I asked if I could speak with him, and I said, listen, this is how I've been feeling. Maybe you don't even know that you're doing this, um, but I don't want the enemy to have any power over me. And so I want to bring this into the light, and I want to I forgive you for these things, and I want, I want you to forgive me for the way I've been avoiding you. And what was amazing is that now uh, he's really a dear friend. He's a priest now, and uh, yeah, so there's, there's something life-giving about this forgiveness that not only was I able to sit with him and eat with him, but there's now new life that is able to come about, a new friendship, something that's beautiful but doesn't flow from me. It overflows from the goodness of God. You see, when I forgive, I don't forgive abundantly and overflowing. Often I forgive with a tight-lipped forgiveness. Kind of just barely forgiving. Just like, yeah, I, I guess I will, but don't let it happen again. You see, this divine act of surrender, it's when we set aside our rights. We say, yeah, I know I deserve this, but I'm going to set that aside so that I can give new life to the person who owes me this debt. And that's why it's actually helpful, the Lord's Prayer Another translation, instead of forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, is forgive our debts, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors. Notice what we're praying here when we pray the Our Father is that we're asking God to only be as merciful to us as we are to each other. And that's not because we need to be able to do it on our own. No, that's why the parable isn't about a hypocrite, but it's about someone who doesn't imitate what he's just received. Because we need God's grace and God's strength to be able to do this kind of, of forgiveness. This isn't a double standard parable. This is a parable about imitating our creator, imitating the very mercy that has created us. And so... How is it that we want to live this week? Do we want to live in a way where we're moved with pity, as the king was? Or do we want to live in a way that is attracted by a lust for power? Oh good, I'm finally right. I can finally tell them I told you so. Which way do we want to live? Do we want to be like the Dead Sea or the beautiful Sea of Galilee? And so as we approach this altar to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, let us ask for the grace to be moved to share with others the same mercy we have already received.